unmute Ellie as well. Yeah, don't forget that. Like, Do this way for everybody watching live. She is now. <laughs> you can now hear her. So, uh, I guess welcome everyone to Teaching Tuesday. Uh, this is a Discord stream that we do on Artwatt every Tuesday. Uh, that's it's in the name, and uh, it consists of us or me actually doing a brief lecture that's um, decided by the students. Uh, we do a poll, and then after that, we give feedback on student submissions. Uh, well, so I give the feedback, and then you copy what I say. Uh, so, yeah, so Ellie, then... Ellie gives feedback, I just repeat it. That's usually how yeah. it goes. Um, she's a crucial part of this. She is, like, um, <laughs> we could we could also... Well, actually, let me turn off this border here. Yeah, I was going to say just turn off the border. You're so unprofessional. It's the border? Kind of, it's kind of cringe. Bro. Yeah, you, well, eventually you're going to be in the border one day oh my god you're gonna you're gonna stop being disembodied um but yeah if you want to if you want to actually join artwad you can do it it's very simple just write artwad.com on in the in the little search okay and... fix the title first of all name it um artwad like um expressions no. like you used to name it it's like no one okay this is gr i don't is... this is great because it's um broad. but like it's so to like a an outsider it's like Huh? How do you, you know, uh, how do you change how do you change the title of the stream midstream? I know how you do it on Twitch, but I'm not sure how you do it on YouTube. Uh, it says you cannot change these settings when you're live. I think well because wow. we decide after we start the stream it doesn't really work. Okay. Uh, well, well Ogden is useless as usual, guys. So let's just. Uh... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Boomer tech as usual, guys. So uh, let's, <laughs> let's let's just talk about expressions. Uh, and uh, again, it's going to be briefer. And Antonio, actually, if I remember correctly, he did a TikTok on this pretty recently. He did. Right? He um, did. Yeah. And in it, he essentially talks about um, a very helpful principle, which is to just kind of use a simplified version of an expression as a starting point. Um, and simplified version as in pretty much like an emoji. So if you're doing like a, like a happy face, let me... Uh, see, just get my pressure to work well. Ellie, when you when you message me in Discord, I, I, if I open it, I'll close the, the chat. So how does that work? You know, do you, do you understand? Okay, so she's uh, she's muted. Okay, okay, that's fine. So let's just. Uh, Let's just continue on here and turn on the chat. Uh, well, as Antonio talks about in the um, in the classroom, if if you start off with something that simple, it, it kind of gives you a good um, well starting point, and then you're just building on top of it. And it's, everybody's familiar with like if you want to do an angry face, you do something like this. But it's actually true that this is what happens with the muscles. Of course, the face is very complex, and there's a lot of well, I guess this is also maybe worth explaining if somebody's unfamiliar, but the face has muscles the same way that your body has muscles, except they're a lot less large, they have a lot less mass, and you usually don't see them hy hypertrophy, so you don't like build facial muscles. Um, but they are there, and even though they are pretty um, unsubstantial when it comes to form, and most of the form... This is a very strange head I drew here. Most of the form of the face is um, built by the skull and some fat as well. That's a very good win. <laughs> but the the face is like 90% just bone, especially like if you look at the upper portion of it, the cranium is just a bone there and, and almost only skin. And then... Uh, you have a bit of fat, and fat as well has distinct pockets. So as you age, it, the it, wrinkles are one thing, but fat will also start sort of separating, um, which is kind of off topic. But in any case, those are the three things that you have on the face. You have the skull or the bone, the fat and the muscle, and the muscle, well, there's also cartilage, but that's part of the bone. And then the muscle, again, is not very large. But what it does is um, it pulls and shortens just as like any other muscle will uh, and by contracting a muscle will create an expression so if 
you really want to get into like the nitty gritty of expressions and if you really want to learn them um, you can actually learn each muscle separately you can learn where they're placed and I don't actually know this like I've gone through them but then I I forgot because I don't really use like that technical knowledge too much but people that work in like 3d animation for example that rig faces they actually need to know this much much better unless they want to make something really uncanny with, with their expressions but um, if you want to get deep again you can learn the muscles and um, there's certain ways to code or, or sort of uh, there's like a system of naming and they're called actions and when a muscle contracts then that's that's called a certain action like action 29 or something and there's a bunch of them um, but th that's the mechanism and I just wanted to touch on that that's actually what happens the muscles contract just like any other muscle in the body will contract but that's not really practically helpful in understanding um, or in drawing let's say it's it's helpful when it comes to very subtle expressions um, and it's something that you definitely should look into at a certain point but when you're just starting off and you want to improve your expressions quickly I think this kind of symbolic thinking is the best way to go and uh, again you, you would just start off let's kind of like demo this almost um, <laughs> let me use this let me demo this real quick so um, I'm just gonna stretch it out a little bit the way that you can you can actually do this is by starting off with this very very simplified version of an expression and the nose, as you can see, is excluded primarily because even though there are muscles that attach to the nose and move it, it's actually the most um, fixed portion of the, the face. And that's why like, it's kind of excessive to put it in here. It doesn't do much. It doesn't contribute to this expression specifically. While the brows and the eyes as well are much more expressive. And the mouth is... If you look at any kind of emoji, the mouth is pretty much the, the most... Um, important or the kind of like the core element of it because it can move so much because it can open like this and it can really stretch out and really pucker up as well so the two most important elements really are the mouth and the brows and then the eyes will generally tend to kind of follow the brows so if you raise your eyebrows like this your your eyes will open if you uh, close them or kind of furrow them generally your eyes will squint a little bit more so i want to add it's kind of cursed, but I want to add the uh, the brass here, and then if if of course this is not practically how you would do this, but it is a good demonstration of the the principle. So if I lighten this and I draw on top of it, all I have to do essentially is add anatomy. So if I add, and again the nose is very doesn't really matter so much, but if I add detail to it, and I might even add it, the proportions to make them a little bit more believable, but if I add the detail. I'm going to make this cursed uh, intentionally. This is not... I'm, I'm now intentionally making a creepy smile. Nice. You know, th this is a, a believable expression. And the reason why you would actually do this, the reason why you would want to do this, is because um, it's usually... In, in, well, in most cases, you want to... Um, you're better off having your expression be more expressive than less and if you start off with something as symbolically expressive as like sort of an emoji then it's you're you're making certain that it's more likely that you don't make it too watered down and too weak uh, but the other element the one that actually came to mind when we did the poll that I wanted to talk about here apart from this as a starting point which could be practical and could be helpful is um, the squashing and the stretching and a lot of people are familiar familiar with the the principle, uh, and and it's like heavily emphasized in uh, animation. But the simple idea is that the body generally, as it moves, will um, if you look at it, or if you kind of want to illustrate this, you can look at a simplified ball. It will either stretch or it will squash. So it moves um, sort of elastically. That's the point. And when it comes to the torso specifically, but also the body at large what generally happens is that one portion or one side will stretch and then the other will squash so um, this elasticity is kind of um, it has a, an inverse 
reaction in most cases. So if you stretch out one thing on one side of the body, then another thing on the other side will generally squash. So this might be the body from the front, but a similar thing would happen, let's say from the, the side as well. Like if you do something like this, then you might actually start seeing the processes of the spine. You might start seeing the spine better on this side. And then here you will generally get wrinkling and a squashing effect. So it's present in the torso primarily, but it's also present in expressions and that's kind of an overlooked element <clears throat> and it's um i think most overlooked in the sense that um what people will tend to do is let's say with this guy here they will just sort of draw the um expression in the same place where the facial feature would be so let's say for example if this character is displeased like so let's say it's angry uh, what people will do is instead of considering uh, the stretching in this case that will cause movement of the facial feature because your mouth can actually move around for example mouth again is the the most uh, I guess malleable part of the the face and the most variable when it comes to expressions your mouth can move around people will not consider that they will not consider the stretching that can happen and they will just place the expression or the sort of like uh, superficial form of the expression on the face um, so I think that's really um, it's it's a factor of expressions and it's more basic and more fundamental than the actual like the actual form that happens the, the way that the actual mouth will curve down it's this is a more superficial expression than the fact that the mouth will actually move down in a sense if that makes if that actually makes any sense but um what that would imply let's say if we're trying to apply this expression to this head is that instead of just drawing again on the same place i might put and this will not look good and it doesn't really have to but i, I can put the uh mouth lower and stretch out this way and as i mentioned there will then be an opposite reaction of squashing which in this case, we'll just sort of create a deeper kind of furrow next to the chin. So all the mass will move down from here. <laughs> this is a very funny expression. It doesn't, it doesn't really look good, but this will stretch as the mouth moves down and then this will furrow and there will be a larger mass here. And uh, inversely, if you create a smile, which is also um, kind of a, a thing that you often see the part here let's say if the character actually like in a neutral expression maybe there is a step here that's clear sort of a a clear shadow let's say and it looks like this this is the, the neutral exp expression if the character smiles all of this uh, mass all of this form will stretch out and so not only will the mouth raise up uh, more or less but it will also flatten the form here so it will not be as deep but then on the other side, you need to get that squashing. Uh, and this is what people often kind of miss from a smile is, is that they might add a furrow, but they don't, they often don't consider the, the mass of the cheeks. And now again, this might not look good and probably won't because I'm just doing something very quick. But they don't consider that there's actual mass here that's, that <laughs> this, this guy looks uh, uncomfortable, but there's actual mass that, that squishes in this area and another thing that might happen um, and, and again this you know the starting point of this can actually be the emoji it's, it's that simple but then once you start off with let's say the emoji like this then you have to consider and ask yourself what's going on with the expression so which elements are squashing and which elements are stretching that's that's sort of the whole point here so if this part is stretching and this is squashing then uh, if we kind of follow this through and look at the eyes as the second element that's actually uh, malleable you will often get kind of bags under the eyes uh, now depends on how much fat there actually is in the cheeks but if this squashes then it might actually run into the eye bag and so you might get a, a deeper form happening like this and, and you see that the principle which is quite simple if you um, exemplify it in, in a bowl can actually be very useful in surface form in, in actually explaining and describing surface forms so, you know, for example, with the, the brows now, uh, if they furrow, there's less fat in the, in the forehead so, and in the, the nose bridge. 
there's almost no fat actually there's like you have bone and then you have a little layer of subcutaneous fat and then you get skin so there will be this um effect will be less pronounced but still you will get wrinkling which is just your squash and then in on this side you might actually get the uh, brow ridge to protrude more because this whole area in the forehead stretches and so it will uh, kind of open up and leave the underlying form of the skull more bare and more visible so th that's really the main thing that i wanted to talk about here is the squash and stretch both as it pertains to actual movement of features primarily the mouth as something that's often overlooked but then also of course and everybody's familiar with the fact that brows move so movement and change of proportion based on squash and stretch but also implying and working with form uh, based on squash and stretch so hopefully that that wasn't too rambly um, <laughs> some people have more fat in the forehead oh my that's amazing actually yeah you're, you're discriminating bro some people do have uh, uh, the the forehead sort of an, um, an interesting <laughs> aside um wait, let me let me find an image of this um the face as i mentioned has muscles and the primary sort of muscles that can actually hypertrophy are uh, this one on the side of the jaw i think it's called is it called the mattis or, so, or something like that uh, it's the chewing muscle here and then the temporal muscle on the side of the head and uh, interestingly both of them contribute to chewing this one more so than this one uh, but if you have somebody who's decently lean and if you look at them chew you will sometimes see movement on the side of their forehead because this muscle is contracting and it actually goes through the zygomatic arch here so through the cheekbone and it connects to the jaw so when it shortens it makes sense that it will pull the jaw up and then th the same thing happens here except this one attaches under the cheekbone this is just an aside that it has nothing to do with expressions but these two are most massive they have the largest volume and they can hypertrophy and especially if you abuse steroids if you take like human growth hormone or something like that the um especially the um temporal muscle can <laughs> it can become very large so this effect it might be very mystifying to some people the the, the shape of this man's head but really it's this is literally just like a big muscle which in in most normal humans would be flat um and but the muscle hypertrophied because of the, the external hormones uh the exogenous hormones and so uh, you get that and and often with with people that use human gro growth hormone the the face might become more round and sort of filled out because the muscles hypertrophy so it's it's a uh, unrelated but somewhat interesting because it shows you know the same thing that that happens with you know, other skeletal muscles on the body can actually happen with the face but um that's about everything i guess for for the lecture so you guys can start pouring in with the uh, feedback submissions and if you have any questions um of course you can can ask them as well but this was this was pretty brief yeah <clears throat> I feel like I solo carried that lecture, to be honest. I mean, you you didn't really do, do anything. The, the gift um, that you that you put in there was that's great. <laughs> yeah, that that has that has more education value than your whole speech. Right it's actually incredible. I mentioned that actually that the, the the face it has very distinct pockets of fat, and you can actually see that, for example, in, in the gift there how the I guess the the jaw there separates from the um, the double like her chin. chin. Yeah, yeah, you would the expect. Double chin. She has, oh, she doesn't have a. She has one chin, bro. Okay, it's the, just the a big, one huge it's a chin. Big, is yeah, it so big? You, <laughs> <laughs> of course, you see this in real life, and you you know it's obvious. But um, especially with old, older people, you can actually see much more extreme separations. Uh, as the skin loses its elasticity and as it sort of starts drooping. Uh, but yeah it, it's definitely important to consider when it comes to realism like the, the the realistic aspect of doing fat anything it has to do with the fact that especially in the face but also in the body fat will not just like sort of 
smooth everything out, but rather it's going to be in these little pockets. And it usually, like, doesn't happen in the forehead. If you get, like, morbidly obese people, they'll still have normal foreheads. In most cases, this is quite a extreme... <coughs> I, I actually like the the Slayton sisters, by the way. I just want to put that out there. Like, that's who she is in the game. Like, she, I watched that show on TLC, so. Okay, just that, saying. I, <laughs> I would try to hide that fact from everybody if I was you. It, I like TLC, okay? I like trashy TV. You can, like, come at me, you know? I, no, I enjoy it. <laughs> that's fine. That's, that's original right. and um, authentic. Shut, shut up. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, let's do this. The bit, 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 bit. Let's start getting feedback. That All was right, English. Let's, let's go. Um. Uh. The Let's see. Jesus. Oh, I remember him showing this in lunch the day. I really like this. So, I think you've got a really cool and unique idea with this. Like, is it like a? It's like a wizard who is like animating his figures right with a spell book. It looks mm. really, really cool. So, there's a couple of things though. Um, maybe just the angle of the lens. I don't know, but his arm looks maybe a little long, and because of how the the main thing is actually how you've done the line work, you haven't really used any line weight. I mean, I see you've added some occlusion in there, but I think you're prioritizing the wrong things when it comes to lines. So you're adding occlusion without first establishing your line weight, and that means that things get lost within the image, right? Like you need to have like. Uh, thicker lines and thin lines um, throughout the image, right? And like, f for example, the, the the hand gets completely lost in to to the background because you haven't like distinguished the 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 shapes or like the lines on your piece. Now, this could be an easy fix if you just um, make a new layer and go over the top of it with all the line weight, uh, which I'm sure Ogni will be able to like show yeah, you do, where to put it. Yeah. And then the other thing is actually the, the the candle, like the 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 set dressing you have, it feels um, awkward and a little bit out of place. And I think that's because it's just you have one single candle, right? Which I am assuming is your primary light source. Now it's just like sort of there, like it's not really doing anything for the composition or, or for the set dressing. Like if you're going to have something in the scene, have it, and especially if it's a light, like a light source, right? And have it like be obvious right have it be there because at the minute it gets lost in the background it's you know it's a kind of like a boring shape as well i know you tried to do the big medium small the candles uh, but i didn't even notice the other candles and again that could be down to line weight but i would like m move it a little bit because it is looks a bit awkward like awkwardly placed almost it's not tangents in but it looks squished in between two uh, elements then it, it just looks a bit awkward right um now that's just down to your set dressing skills and, and whatnot. So just play around with it a little bit, move things around. But overall, I like the idea. I like the piece. It's just a few small things you need to work on. Um, but Ogni, what do you think? Uh, well, yeah, I, on, the, on the point of the um, line weight, it's only really important and relevant in, in a scene such as this. If you're looking at my drawing here, for example, the distinction that a thicker outside line will make here is not really that important because nothing is overlapping. So uh, the clarity is already there with the white background. I don't really need to clarify much. But once you start getting into something as complex as this, um, the occlusion shadows are not enough to hold it. And if you intend to have a drawing that, that is just bare without any flat colors, then you definitely need to distinguish your overlapping somehow. And I think this is actually a good example in, in this image alone, how the book actually gets a lot from a, a thicker line weight, whereas the arm, for example, really doesn't so much because there's not you know, there's not much overlapping. It's overlapping with something that's very far away and it's very light already. And then the head actually would probably get the least because there's only a flat white background. So it doesn't really, uh, there's nothing to distract and there's nothing to, to be uncertain about. So that's just like a little side note on line weight. It, it, you can go through the whole piece and try to consistently use um, you, you know thickness that makes sense so if this is thick then if this is not that much further away then it should be thicker probably but 
you don't have to go be as a mechanic about it and maybe it's tedious as well so this is actually what matters the, the elements that actually overlap a lot or uh, also often elements that are in the sort of extreme foreground so if this is very close <laughs> then um, you would probably want to signify that somehow because uh, it's sort of a, a separate plane uh, on its own and I was also kind of drawing out with with the red there um, the perspective because it feels although I'm not really sure why that well of course the horizon line is here but then it feels like this kind of goes out from it somewhere it, it, or in other words it feels like this is too open like we're looking at it from too far above for the horizon line that is actually placed here and I, I think what would make this appear more flat is if these were at a more extreme angle um, I'm not certain how extreme but what I would do in this case is probably just rebuild the um, the whole grid and it could be simple enough just find two points that are close to what you already have and try to bring your lines back and see if um, if they kind of line up because for example these are very parallel so if the horizon line is there they don't really go to a vanishing point um, so there's some inconsistency within the grid and then finally um, Elliot mentioned that it feels like the arm is long and that's one aspect of this but it also feels like the figure kind of gets lost underneath the folds and, and this is the last point that I want to make I think um, when you have any type of drapery and I've actually done a recently a, a classroom on painting drapery but I actually go over like fundamental drawing principles uh, in there as well and I talk about how if you have drapery it almost inevitably is in the context of a figure and it doesn't exist outside of it and really once you look at it um, drapery is almost like half of the battle is trying not to lose the figure and make it all wobbly and spaghetti uh, armed and I feel like a bit of that is happening here where uh, the drapery in certain parts starts to feel disembodied and the way to battle this and the way to actually make it feel more um, related to the figure is twofold it's to try <laughs> fold again because it's like drapery it's to try to show the the cylinders it's generally going to be cylinders try to show them somehow with hatching for example if i do something like this it's a kind of a cheap thing but it already shows okay this is where the arm is um so that's one way quite an easy way but then the other is to actually try to use the folds to show the cylinders so if i kind of wrap uh, let's say a fold around like this this is implying not only that there's a cylinder of a uh, in bunched material but also that it's going around the larger arm cylinder so what i would do is and you know this is probably frustrating to to hear but apart from rebuilding the whole grid i would also rebuild the the body here and maybe just put it under here and try to find certain ways usually again by wrapping these folds to show the underlying structure and you can also try to push um, certain parts in the silhouette so the shoulder could be more clearly shown here and on this side as well maybe you could somehow imply where the shoulder is it feels like the shoulder is Kind of off as well so i would just rebuild the whole thing uh probably it also feels like there's way too much body up here like it, it connects here so this is either all of this is either the thickness of the the clothing the robes or there's like a hunch there it's it's very disconnected uh so and it's probably um a symptom of not building from the the mannequin up so i would have to kind of go back if i were you and, and rebuild it but that's about everything i have all right um Let's see. We, now we have Zanoff, and he's been working on cr creature design. Uh, exploration for the biology of the creatures and the environment, etc. He was wondering how, how you'd go around exploring those things. So, I don't really have particularly a lot of feedback for the uh, images themselves, because your question is about how you'd explore, like, the environment they're in, like, I guess their design in relation to that. Um, and I I want to touch on a couple of things. So the first one is still has to be believable, right? So if you're combining two creatures together, for example, here you have like a panda and a whale, and then you have a deer and I think also a whale. So these are land creatures, right? And you're combining them with sea creatures, which can work, you know, we've seen it work, for example, in Suicide Squad, you have that shark guy. Um, but again, he's very sort of anthropomorphized. He's, um, you know, yeah, so if you're going to do that, I would 
ground it in more you either go anthropomorphized like that or you go like a creature right and in which case you have to make it believable so you wouldn't really see a um a land animal and a water animal combined together especially if it doesn't really have like a purpose right so i mean i'm talking about if you want to make it like realistic or whatever right um so like the deer and the whale you know how does that make sense like what's the purpose of this like you know you're talking about you you want to think about the diet and like the environment which indicates to me you want to make it more believable but it's not the the design itself isn't believable because you're you're mixing two completely separate animals into one and putting it on in in an environment where it just it wouldn't like it wouldn't be right so i would actually like pick animals that are sort of from a similar biome i'm sorry, like minecraft there don't I? like but anyway <laughs> Um, yeah, so I would say that's the main issue is believability and picking creatures that work well together. And if you want to go sort of crazy and combine like sharks and, and squirrels, then, you know, make it more crazy, make it more stylized, make it um, more anthro or, or whatever else. Like, because the, I, I remember during my mentorship, with, with, during my mentorship with Evan Munston, he did like a scale of believability and fantasy, right? And you have to like, balance out everything. So if you're going to go for fantasy, you have to go for that fully. Because if you start mixing in like um, more realistic elements in that, it, people lose their immersion in that. And and same goes for if you if you want to make it realistic. If you start combining like really fantasy things into that, again you lose the immersion. So you have to like have a, a nice balance of of things in your designs uh, hope that makes sense i know i rambled a little bit but maybe Ogni can yeah i have a with. i have a practical sort of um guideline on this on generally the way that you can be more certain that your design will will be just higher quality and more appealing if you intend to combine things so the the general um idea and i, I don't know if i've heard anybody actually talk about this maybe this is my my genius uh, new new idea uh, probably not but uh, in any case i separate the design of a creature into the structure of it and into the surface of it and it's generally not advised to combine very different structures um so and especially if they don't make f sense functionally together so what that means is for example if this this uh, creature doesn't move quickly it doesn't need this huge of a tail for balancing and so in that case maybe the tail is like um what is it what is the word for grabbing there's there's a word for that but that's not implied because there's also structures that that indicate that it's for um, swimming so usually if you combine structures it's a good idea to of course consider the environment but also stay within you know the same kind of family or at least kingdom. Um, so th that's one thing. And then when it comes to the surface, th that's actually what uh, it makes sense to combine with the structure. Or in other words, you take a structure from a certain animal uh, and you can take that literal structure. So you can take like an actual panda or you can take sort of elements of the panda. So you might modify it in certain ways, maybe make the, the head, if we're doing like a giant panda, maybe we can make the head really small. So I don't know, this is like the this is the giant panda okay so so you, you change you, you take elements of the structure but you you can change it if you'd like and you take a surface and you apply it here and and that's actually what uh, and of course you can have more finesse to it but that's actually what makes the design feel more coherent and less kind of frankenstein monster-esque so there's no kind of stitching up parts there's a whole um, structure that's coherent because you didn't take it from vastly different uh, inspirations and, and places and there's also a surface that's generally coherent because you just took it from one animal or, or one sort of uh, uh, I guess um, source so it doesn't have to be an animal you can take I don't know maybe this this guy has like a some sort of a, a pattern to it or something but even if I add something random if it's uh, coherent and consistent 
within the surface and there's again a coherent structure then the whole thing will feel a lot more coherent and it's helpful actually to think about these two things and to kind of um think about how much you're modifying them and almost like think about um them as as scales like how much surface do you have versus how much structure i don't know if that that makes sense the the, the scale thing but the separation i think definitely does and it's very helpful so here you're actually starting to do that um, you have the surface of a whale and i guess this is sort of like a pun almost visually because this has kind of a killer whale pattern the the panda does um but in this case you're you're taking the the surface of a whale and you're applying it to the whole structure and this actually feels more coherent than this because of that so this is actually a practical example of how this works uh better but in that case you know the the fins um don't really make a lot of sense and when it comes to the surface um it doesn't necessarily only have to be kind of like printed on it can also be for example like if this uh, this whole creature had scales that's also like a surface element or even if it had little little fins like not probably smaller ones than this to actually appear surface uh, level and and little horns and stuff like that it doesn't have to be just flat surface but it is not structural it's not like the, the broad building kind of mannequin of it but yeah i just wanted to talk a little bit about that as hopefully kind of at least an interesting concept and it, it's usually helpful when you're designing so that's about everything for me all right all right all right and uh, now we have ivo a nice little portrait design and i really like this i just want to say i think it's i like the style i think you've done a great job um there's only like one thing i mainly want to focus on with this feedback though is that's like is the perspective of her body in relation to her head and you also lose a bit of that perspective in the hair now hair is still a shape it's still a form it's still going to follow the, pers the perspective of the character right and it looks like you've tried to draw her in a three-quarter view but it does her the the angle that she's looking in, it doesn't match the angle of her body. And then like the jewels as well around her, on her shoulders especially, they look a little bit flat. And I just, I think that it's all down to like perspective issues and stuff like mm. that. But, you know, and like the the neck looks flat too. Like the, the neck is a round form, right? And I, I see you've tried to um, match that w with the shadow, like from her face, her chin. Uh, but it still looks flat. Like, I, I don't think you're um, achieving that roundness feel, um, you know, with the shadow and, like, the, 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 the hues and stuff like that in the skin. Um, and I think Ogni will be able to, to, to show you what I mean, hopefully. Uh, well, he will, because, yeah. you know, he's, he's Ogni. But anyway, yeah, what do you Yeah, I'm just, I'm just out here repeating the feedback. Uh, yeah. Can I, can, I get, um, can I start on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Um, I, I agree with Ellie and it's it's difficult to quantify like there are certain kind of structural inconsistencies and when you look at something that has a couple of them it's kind of difficult to put your finger on exactly what's going on and, and what's wrong so I think the hair might make sense in the, in the sense that um, it doesn't really feel like you have kind of like a hairline it almost feels like unrealistic just kind of functionally like how would the hair start from here and have this kind of a form to it? Um, it's it's a little bit odd, um, but I, I, I couldn't exactly tell why that is on the hair. But there are a certain couple elements that I can't tell. So the neck, I think primarily the issue is kind of, if you had kind of like a, the central almost throat area to it, and then these two cylinders for the uh, muscles, the neck muscles, I think that would give more structure to it. And and those cylinders are almost like a, a midline element as well because they, they function to clearly anchor the neck to the center line of the body. So that would help, I think. If you look at it um, that way, this might also not make a lot of sense. If this is coming from the side, maybe it would be better to actually let it fall to the side, the, the lock of hair there. But this might help with the neck. Um, and then... Uh, I think that would help with the body as well. It would it would feel like the body is turned, and then the the neck is kind of turning the the head. You know, the body is like at three quarters, and the head is starting to get into a profile view. And if that is the case, if the body or the head that is is rotating, your neck muscles will often actually contract. So you would actually maybe 
realistically see more of this. So in any case, this is very good to add. Uh, th that's one element. The other element, as Ellie mentioned, are the ellipses here. And we're imagining this is completely circular from the front, uh, this shape. But then as it rotates around, let's say I have a body like this, and there's the neck. And, and that's also another helpful thing is to maybe try to conceptualize the neck as a cylinder that attaches to the rib cage at an angle, as I've drawn here and here. I think that could help. But if I'm adding my ellipses, what happens, and this is actually a very helpful exercise, is, well, they gradually start becoming more and more narrow until eventually I see them at a, at a profile. So maybe there's some thickness to these, so it might look like this. It's completely flat from the side, and here it's completely fr flat from the front. And th this is actually very helpful uh, as an exercise for indicating depth. So you get a random type of shape like this. You might get some cross contour lines to it. And then this is a very sus shape. And then you start adding ellipses and you start getting a good sense of how much you should rotate an ellipse for it to feel like it's on a sort of a at an angle, at an appropriate angle. And this whole little demonstration was just to say that it doesn't feel like these are at an appropriate angle. They feel more like this flat view. Whereas if this is a three quarter view of the body, they should feel more like this, something in between. So the issue is sort of the degree of flattening of the ellipse, as well as the fact that if you place an ellipse, uh, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds, but if you place an ellipse at a surface, uh, it has the, like the short axis of it has to be uh, at 90 degrees to that surface. So if I have say something like this, my degrees or my ellipses will rotate along with the form. So those are the two issues that might occur. I might misplace the angle of the ellipse. So it might be, let's say, at this angle where it should be at this one. And I might also misjudge the um, the thickness of it, I guess. And I might for sure need more or less. Here it's for sure too little. And then with this one, for example, as, as in this diagram here, you would probably need to get into almost like a completely flat view or actually a flat view like this. So that's another thing, um, maybe a little bit too rambly. And then the two final things that I think I want to wrap this up with is the eye. It kind of feels like it's very uh, flat on the the head. Uh, and I think you have some nice elements of roundness here, but it would need to be followed through in the bottom lead as well. So I think the upper lead actu actually works pretty well. But then the bottom one is quite flat. So if you ha add some thickness to it like this, and then kind of add maybe even a line or at least some sort of a value transition here to indicate that that round eyeball still continues. I think that could be uh, quite helpful there. And then with the ear also, you should probably kind of connect this area and bring it in. Well, this is actually just sort of like an anatomical aspect of ears. They they will overlap very clearly in this place um, with with like a, a thicker part right there. And then you have the, the interior of the ear in there. So. Th that's just to say that there should be a deeper form in there. And I think those couple things would solve most of the issues. It also doesn't feel like this is connecting. Like if this is the ear there, it feels like it's going through this area very high up, which is not very usual. You'd probably want to pierce your ear there uh, for something this large. So a couple inconsistencies. You could also overlap this part, the bottom part of the ear. You could show a little bit of a uh, transition there. But I think that's about everything here. So in conclusion, you should definitely practice this, either with actual bodies, and th that's an interesting, uh, I think also a fun exercise, you just place a body, draw a mannequin, maybe even draw like a surface form of it, so maybe some anatomy to it, and then almost pretend like it's tattooed with a bunch of circles. Um, it's a, Of course, you would simplify the, the form, so you're not going over like small muscle bumps or whatever, but you're going around the body and figuring out exactly how much you should foreshorten. And then, of course, you can also do it with random forms. But that should, a, a bit of time um, exercising that should solve this issue and you should get a better sense and a better feel for it. All right. All right. Oh, let's, uh, all right. All right. Let's do Zen. Zen. Is that Bibit? Is it him? Yeah, let's do him. Um, so he says he knows the deck is a bit wonky, but he wanted to mainly focus on painting human skin. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to say is actually, I think you should um, not worry about painting yet, because I yes. think 
your forms are lacking a lot and your fundamental skills are lacking a little bit in the in the form of like the head and like um your an anatomy as well like it looks very very flat and like that, that's just because it, you maybe didn't construct it correctly um or you didn't really keep in mind the forms of what you're drawing so i'm sure i, mean, I think good feedback for this organ would just be to demonstrate head construction yeah yeah um yeah because like i don't think there's much you can do in terms of overpainting this but if you just show how you'd construct like a basic like loomis head and just talk about the forms of that that would yeah. like, help so yeah Augie, what, what so do you think? this and and i had this as well when when i was starting out a, a construction like this from a first glance might appear kind of counterintuitive but the it's somewhat paradoxical that the more advanced I become and the more uh, I improve, the more I realize that almost all of my drawing mistakes specifically come from a lack of construction and a lack of simplified thinking. Um, and it's very difficult to manipulate and tackle these complex forms, specifically in the face as the most recognizable element that, that humans can see. It's very difficult to tackle them without an underlying geometrical structure that you can rely on. So this is using forms that we can, the, the idea is that you can use something that's reliable and constant, such as a, a sphere, which is entirely you know, perfectly round, so it's very constant, and then some modified elements as well. Um, and I don't wanna actually get into drawing um, them out, but um, because there's there's classrooms and there's um, there's courses on that on Artwad, uh, and you can, I don't actually know exactly. Like in the in the beginner course, there's actually like a module on that, right? On the head construction. So we have a, the, a figure module, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So th there's definitely a lot of material tackling this, both specifically as it relates to the head, the figure, and then also some broad um, classrooms that Antonio had done that just talk about the principle itself, the principle of manipulating geometric forms, uh, but. The way to solve most drawing issues is to go back to the simple forms. And you've probably noticed that with a lot of feedback, like here, for example, it's just losing the simple forms. In this case, I think the, the issue uh, is probably a lack of them to begin with. But regardless, it would uh, be solved by going back to simplifying. So, And I have a portrait course as well. Um, so... That, that could be helpful, although it's a lot more advanced. So I would start with the beginner course and really drill like simple forms. And it might be, it might appear mundane and it probably will be uh, mundane and dry as you exercise, but it will pay off. Uh, and, and again, it is the most important thing in drawing apart from, you know, just sort of flow of line. This is the, the big, big thing. And of course, if you don't completely flat view, having guidelines, uh, for example, like a center line here, will immediately show you where it's lacking. So this is off the center line and then with the ears as well and the whole mass of the, the skull, it's going off this way and then this one is lower. But if you just use shift in Photoshop, you can draw perfectly horizontal and vertical lines and you can very easily place your um, your grid um, that way. And, and even even again, as, as somebody who's advanced, this is what if you do a flat view this is what usually comes up as the issue is you just didn't track symmetry correctly uh, but i think that that should you know be a good pointer just look at the material that we have i think that's that's a better explanation you know all right <clears throat> let's uh, do cyan so i mean like he's improved so much like if you've seen his work from a few months ago Ogden, you'd like he's he's come on a long way so I don't think I have. you have well get on it then anyway he... sorry that was aggressive um you have pretty good structure here uh cyan actually and um, there's only a couple of things i want to uh talk about and it's primarily to do with the painting so um i mean i think you've tried to add it in a little bit because the ears are a bit orange but like skin is uh transparent right as light hits it you would have more um orangey reddish ears and like nose and especially on, on, on the jawline I, again i think you've tried to add it it's just i think it's a little bit too subtle right now um but that's like i'm nitpicking right because yeah, this is it, actually too inconsistent it? like there's there's actually enough mm. of subsurface scattering here and here but then it, 
it's not present mm. in a lot of other places. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't have a lot to say because I think you've improved a lot. I, I'd be nitpicking a little bit, but um, I'm sure Ognin will have some. I think yeah. maybe the. Nah, go for it. Yeah, it's just to you. Yeah. Right, so, sorry, me... I don't have a lot to say about this one. <laughs> uh, so. Um... I would agree with Ellie, but I would kind of take it a little bit further and specify that... Let me draw a sphere. This is a skin sphere, and, and this is the, the core of, of the skin material. Um, and, of course, to understand this, you need a certain basic understanding of, of any... of material properties in general. But skin is a material that's both matte, in the sense that it clearly has a light and a shadow side, but it's also somewhat reflective and it will often as you have implied here have specular reflections so reflections of the uh, light source but uh, also and this is the point that most people miss is that it, it's also translucent or it, it's translucent in a very specific way where uh, only of course meat or i guess flesh underneath is not really that translucent and skin is, is also you can actually or not skin but um, bone you can actually shine through it but it, the skin is actually the translucent element here so there's a, a layer of translucent material and what happens with subsurface scattering is that light will let's just draw a diagram here light will come in it will hit that material um, and then it will bounce around in it and it will come out and th that's what causes it to become so warm in, in this particular example because blood is very warm so what happens then with the sphere that's supposed to indicate skin is that not only does it have separate colors for light and shadow but in a lot of cases with light that's direct enough it will get a separate sort of band of color for the halftone that's very saturated in relationship both to light and to shadow so it will be more saturated often than the these two and um, it's also sort of a specific effect that needs to be close to the shadow um, let me explain this real quick so if if the there's light, let's say, shining on this, it's shining on, on the um, the skin sphere, and if that light does indeed come in and bounce out, the portion of it that bounces out will get drowned out by this direct light. Uh, so these beams will not allow this warm light to show. And b because of that, it can only really show next to shadow, and you, you actually have those two uh, situations where it can show right here, next to a cast shadow, uh, because there's a clear jump from in value and as that light comes out and again that effect is happening all over here but it's being drowned out by the direct light uh, it, it, and it happens all over and then all of a sudden it hits shadow so this is actually where it can show up because it's dark enough for for that glow to show and similarly in half tone next to shadow it shows again so it it can only happen next to shadows and th th that's i think the point here is as you render the half tone the subtle half tone let's say there's like a kind of a sunken cheek, for example. You don't really get much, like, doesn't saturate crazily, usually. Uh, that, that saturation will only happen around the shadows again. And if it does, then it should be consistent all over. So you might get a little line with cast shadow and a bit of a softer line with form shadow because form shadow is usually has a, a much softer edge. But I would just follow the effect through. That, that's, I think, the biggest element here when it comes to... Um, material and apart from that the other thing is just color variation so uh, you don't have to go crazy with this you can be pretty subtle but I think some reddening around the nose could help and of course the lips so it might be something like this uh, and this is another sort of small element of skin that makes it feel like skin is coloration and, and subtle color shifts and then you might get some kind of desaturation and darkening below the the eyes like so and then also there's there's a lot of kind of random effects that can happen with it but these are like the basic things that you can add and it starts to feel more skin like because of that variation so those are a couple of things that i wanted to touch on when it comes to the material itself but when it comes to the light the way that you've placed light i think it might be um kind of too much shadow here pretty much because if you look at it um, and if you look at, let's say, a sphere that's supposed to be in this light, let's say, like so, th the sphere is would be lit something like this, based on how you have the face. So this is almost a front light. Uh, it's it's kind of from three quarter, but it's three quarter front. It's not even really three quarter. Um, 
and and even if it was three quarter, there's no reason to assume that the ear is facing away from the light enough to be fully in shadow. This effect almost never never happens uh, with ears when light is in front of the character. The light needs to be behind the character to get subsurface scattering in the ears. Um, so you would probably not actually get this effect, the disappearance at all, um, because this this strong sub subsurface scattering in the ears is a little bit specific and a little bit different from this, in in the fact that ears are very thin uh, and they actually let light through. So if you actually have direct light from the front here, then you might get something more similar to what's going on with the rest of the um, the skin there's no light actually coming through it from behind so again that, that's an effect that's exclusive to rim lights and, and back lights so that's i think the most kind of inconsistent element here you can also get a little bit of a change probably in shape right here but that's that's pretty uh, small and you'll often also get actually light in here the light would need to come from very far up uh, to cast this big of a shadow so often the, the pattern of light and this is you know partially from experience but often the light pattern will actually be on the eye uh, more uh, or you know the eye will actually be in light so it might look more like this but that's about uh everything that i would have there all right um now i can do one more and then i i have to skedaddle but where where i know uh you know somewhere secret you know uh, anyway Huh? I said you know stuff. Okay, but let's I, let's go. You know, s s stuff and things. Anyway, uh, so we have Sarah with a shotgun inspired by white sharks. So, all right. So a couple of things. Um, in the main designs, you have up like the the big ones. I'm not getting a shark from it really. Like the other ones, like the smaller ones, uh, I am, and I actually prefer those. I quite like the bottom design you have going on. Like I can see. Um, shark elements in those ones but not so much in in the main one you have um and another thing is i would maybe exaggerate your shapes a bit more here so you have like this saw effect um well not really it's not an effect but element of the gun right um but like it looks quite you wouldn't do much i don't think <laughs> like uh, it needs to look like it can do damage, right? Because it's a weapon design. It's meant to be, especially if it's a shark, it's meant to be a bit scary and menacing. So I would actually make that a bit bigger, um, a bit more scary looking, right? And make them look more like shark teeth. I think that would work. Like, you know, if you played with that element a bit more, but rather than just having it be steel, I think it'd look cool if it was like uh, teeth of the shark. I think that would look quite nice. Um... And I prefer the the colorways of your other ones because again it reads more like a shark design, um, mm. but that's just you know I'm nitpicking a little bit. Um, and then the other thing is more fundamentally is that your perspective looks a bit inconsistent throughout the the main design. So in, in some areas it looks a bit skewed, like on the the blade, um, and then the, the hilt looks a bit almost bent and a bit inconsistent uh, in relation to the barrel so i would actually draw like just one long perspective box and just make sure it fits within that perspective and like and just uncheck it like that but other than that um i think you know you have a pretty cool idea going on here you know taking a shark and mixing it with a weapon i think that's pretty cool but yeah. i just think overall you can uh, exaggerate some elements and bring in more sharky stuff into it um okay yeah I'll be... all right well, let's let's do it like this i'll, I'll finish I'll, I'll do my uh my feedback here and then we can wrap up the whole thing uh because we yeah. said it's going to be shorter and, and i'm kind of tired as mm -hmm. well so i think i think that's going to be fine yeah um so let, let's do that uh, well i i agree with ellie and i want to again just make it more specific uh and and first of all to contextualize this um th there, there is always the question of your intention and how much of a given inspiration you actually want to show obviously so you might actually intend to to have your influence be more subtle in which case this, this is actually pretty good in in that sense uh, but these are definitely more obvious and i also feel like they're more interesting just like objectively in terms of their shape um this one feels like a kind of a generic hunting rifle with added elements whereas in these ones and i think this is the quality of them that is missing here you've actually gone ahead and changed the whole structure 
uh, not of course the you know hilt there's a hilt and there's a barrel but you've changed the proportions considerably and and they're they're much different and so for example with this one the the hilt is much longer it feels more like a shotgun but it's got this interesting large shape to it whereas here only the small shapes are changed really like just smaller elements of the big shapes um here the, the whole big shape is, is modified so i think that's another quality of this apart from being more obviously inspired by sharks but when it comes to the shark influence i think it's helpful to try to actually just sort of create a diagram for yourself and figure out exactly why something would look shark like and what kind of shape might make it look like that and it, it can actually be like quite obvious and quite simple but it's still helpful so the first thing and the kind of iconic thing is of course you would have some type of um bent triangle like this it's spiky and this shape could be used in many different configurations you can make it very long or very uh fat and you can kind of probably skew it in different ways so it can be at different angles but this quality of having one convex and one concave side to it i think is something that needs to be consistent and maintained and that's a callback to the fins of course um, the whole body is pretty round which could be an element to consider just roundness instead of flatness or um, straightness and uh, maybe that's why these work better as well is because they're they're a bit thicker um and then the final thing that they're calling back in uh, back to in the uh, saws are, are of course the teeth and they're they're not they have a very specific shape as well and they're actually nothing like this well they are triangular but they're not bent they're very explicitly triangular they're they're a literal triangle and there's also gaps between them uh, and so even though this is similar you know it's it's like this those two elements the gap and the straightness make this much different so i would actually if if i do this exercise i'd go and do these diagrams figure out exactly specifically what kind of shape is present and how i might echo that in the design and then with with that um clarification for myself i'd, I'd have i think less issue and i would make it easier on myself to actually show uh but yeah as ali said you you show front planes here but then a back plane here and here and then there's front planes again so i think you know more box drawing would pr probably uh, be beneficial uh, it's beneficial for most people but um, i'm not gonna look draw over this I, I just thought this as a framework and as context could be helpful and and i wouldn't maybe even redo this maybe i'd go into another design with a different animal and try to apply this idea and and i think it's a good exercise so that's about everything that i have all right so uh, i know that this was a bit shorter this week guys but um ognian he's just you know He's he's a he hates all of you so he's a very no I'm sorry no um, you shouldn't have you, you didn't have to reveal that <laughs> <laughs> okay no for real um I hope you guys enjoyed it regardless that it was a bit shorter I hope it was useful to you guys and if you missed your work for feedback don't worry you can always post it next week because we do it every single Tuesday so thanks for coming along guys the uh, okay is there anything the plugs. anything you wanna add you have to Plug? do the plugs, plugs? Yeah, yeah. Oh my, uh, yes, don't forget to check out our TikTok. We have a new TikTok video out on how to paint like Valorant. So if you want to check that out, please go for it. It's very exciting. That's crazy. And also, it's crazy. And follow our Instagram and also, of course, follow Ognian because, you know. Oh, amazing. Um, I'm he's, eh, eh, uh, I'm he's, decent. He's, he's, he's okay. He's an average guy. Yeah. <laughs> so. But in like a good <laughs> no, way. No, I'm joking. Right. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. So thanks for coming along, guys. We appreciate right. it. So we'll see you later. Hey, thank you, everyone. And follow me, by the way. Yeah, follow me. All right, yeah. Uh, have yeah, a good follow evening. Me. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>